Boa tarde a todos, meu nome é Ana Luísa e dando continuidade ao evento, é com grande satisfação que apresento a próxima palestrante do nosso pré-evento SOBEP 2024. Antes que eu apresente a Dr. Wu, gostaria de ressaltar que caso você tenha alguma pergunta durante a palestra dela, peço que por gentileza escrevam no chat e que seja em inglês para facilitar a interação da palestrante com o público. Assim que terminar a palestra, teremos 15 minutos para perguntas e discussão. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Organizing Committee of the Brazilian Society of Oral Medicine and Pathology, it is my distinct privilege and honor to introduce our next guest speaker. Today, we are honored to have Dr. Suk Bin Wu here with us. I'm sure everyone is aware that this isn't her first time talking to a Brazilian audience since she was with us for the 2018 SOBET meeting in Rio. Dr. Wu needs no introduction. However, in case you don't know who she is, Dr. Suk Bin Wu is professor of oral pathology at Harvard School of Dental Medicine, consultant oral and maxillofacial pathologist at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and Boston Children's Hospital, and attending oral medicine specialist at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. She is director of the Center of Oral Pathology at Strata DX Incorporated in Lexington, Massachusetts, and program director for the Advanced Oral Pathology Training Program at Harvard. She is board certified in both oral and maxillofacial pathology and oral medicine, and is active in training residents and graduate students in both specialties. She received the Distinguished Senior Faculty Award from the Harvard School of Dental Medicine in 2012. She has published more than 300 papers and book chapters, including a textbook on oral pathology, the third edition of which was published in 2023. Today, her lecture is entitled Proliferative Leukoplakia, Past, Present, and Future. Dr. Wu, thank you so much for accepting our invitation and for sharing your ins insights and expertise on such an important topic in our field. The floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Um, this is Sukwu speaking to you from Boston, Massachusetts. I, I just want to thank so much the organizers uh, from SOBAP who invited me to speak and to present here. Uh, and that's Dr. Alan Santos, Dr. Pablo Vargas, and Dr. Ana Luisa Rosa. Thank you so much. So let's just dive right into this very fascinating topic, which is proliferative leukoplakia past, present, and future. Notice I did not use uh, the word verrucas, and I will explain to you why as I go along. Uh, just to let you know that the third edition of my oral pathology textbook is now available, and I hope that you will find it interesting. It's completely updated with all the molecular findings in all the salivary gland tumors and bone tumors, as well as odontogenic tumors. So for today, I hope that at the end of this session, you will recognize that we have not yet established a universally accepted definition of proliferative leukoplakia, which I will refer to as PL. Be aware that not all PLs are verrucas. I hope I can convince you of that. Recognize that the early lesions show only hyperkeratosis, but this is not any hyperkeratosis. It is a hyperkeratosis that is not reactive but has architectural features of dysplasia. And some people refer to this, I refer to it as hyperkeratosis, not reactive, and other people refer to it as differentiated dysplasia, similar to differentiated vulva intraepithelial neoplasia. I hope that we will recognize that the pathophysiology of how cancer develops from such hyperkeratotic lesions and Finally, just very briefly, to consider managing proliferative leukoplakia with topical therapy. I'm just showing you four cases here, and I wonder if all of these get signed up by you or your colleagues as hyperkeratosis. Each of these carries a completely different diagnosis. I do not sign any of these as hyperkeratosis alone, uh, because this is not accurate and it's not helpful for the clinician because it doesn't give them etiology or prognosis. And we're going to come back to this slide later. We all know the definition of leukoplakia, so I'm not going to go over it again. But I am going to talk about how PL, which is also called PDL, um, 
is uh, defined by the WHO according to Dr. Wanako Rasuri, of course, in 2021. So we, let's go to the bottom half of this definition. Um, and it talks about how this condition affects more than two different oral sites with the existence of a verrucous area. So I think I will have to maybe convince you that that's not necessary because the initial clinical presentation could be flat and white, and that's absolutely correct. And even the late lesions can be flat and white. They can sometimes have a light conoid appearance clinically. I'm not sure I agree with that. Okay, they can certainly have a lymphocytic band and they can sometimes be signed out as like not by the pathologist. I agree with that. And this is one of the big problems which we need to deal with because of course they get treated as LP and this is nothing like LP. So let's take a look at some cases and all of you are familiar with PL. This is a patient with proliptive leukal plaque is kind of verrucous or very deeply fissured, but notice here is pretty smooth and it has a red component. So here we have an erythral leukal plaque. Here we have an homogenous leukal plaque. Here is starting to get thicker. Here we have a fissured leukal plaque, and this patient developed a squamous cell carcinoma. The original biopsy, of course, showed only hyperkeratosis. If you biopsy it from here, that's what it's going to show. But yet we know that this area, this area with just hyperkeratosis is going to become cancer. What this means is we have to change the criteria for the diagnosis of dysplasia. And that fortunately has already happened. And the WHO has already put out their new criteria. And I'm gonna go over some of those today. So here's a patient with proliptic leukoplakia. Again, notice this is a little fissured, but the most important part is that it is demarcated, which indicates that it's a clonal lesion. Look at this, very demarcated. This is smooth, little fissured, and this is a clonal lesion. This is mutated over here, it's not mutated over here. Similarly, you see it on the bottom and on the side of the tongue, and we're gonna be seeing this picture again later on. This patient with a fairly homogeneous smooth leukoplakia developed a verrucous carcinoma, and on the palatal mucosa, a second verrucous carcinoma, which eventually led to the death of this patient. And we all know that uh, many patients with PL develop multiple cancer. So let's go to the past and how this all came about. So historically, this was first, um, at this entity was proposed by Dr. Hansen and Dr. Silverman, whom we all know. And this was in 1985 where he called this PBL, the disease of unknown origin, while we know now that it's caused by mutations, it begins as a simple hyperkeratosis. And I can't just stress how important this is, but tends to spread and become multifocal. Is that true? Does it have to be multifocal? We know it is maybe slow growing. Sometimes it can grow fast. It's persistent and irreversible, of course, because it's mutated. And in time, it can become exophytic, what like, maybe not what like, becomes very resistant to all forms of therapy, and they often will develop malignant transformation. So this is the very famous chart from Lou Hansen's paper, but I want to draw your attention to this. Here's a normal mucosa with grade one to grade two. Notice, and I don't mean if he, I don't know if he meant to do this, that this epithelium is a little bit thinner than this. That becomes important. Then notice it becomes verrucous and exophytic. This is verrucous. And then it becomes downward or endophytic. And then it becomes the squamous cell. The problem with this is sometimes some people get the mistaken idea that this is continuous. In other words, it becomes verrucous carcinoma and then it can become a papillary squamous cell carcinoma and then it becomes less differentiated. And that's not the case. It doesn't do that. It can go from here to here or here to here. Oops, excuse me. Um, and this is a diagram uh, that was um, from a different paper, just sort of showing you uh, the same thing, but just in a, a slightly modernized version of it. And we're gonna see how we can modify this particular algorithm. This is from Dr. Hansen's paper. And I wanna show you his case 12, 
He called this grade two PDL. So it's this one. And it is atrophic. You can see the epithelium is atrophic. This is one of the most important features of the new architectural criteria, which is a low power diagnosis. There's hyperkeratosis. Notice that the thickness of this epithelium is greater than half the thickness of the underlying epithelium. In fact, it is equal thickness. That's a very, very bad sign and an early sign that this is dysplasia. I shouldn't say it's a bad sign. It's a very early architectural sign of dysplasia. And this is a different, also a diagram from his paper showing very thick hyperkeratosis. And he calls this grade four PDL, which I kind of disagree with because grade four PDL is a verrucous epithelial proliferation. And if you look at this, the epithelium is, cor epithelium is corrugated, uh, but not particularly verrucous. There's acanthosis. Notice the thickness of the keratin is equal or greater than the thickness of the epithelium. And that's a very important architectural sign of dysplasia, even when there's no cytologic evidence of dysplasia. So grade four here is verrucous hyperplasia. There's really very little of that, but the keratin has a Christmas tree appearance. So this is what another thing that Dr. Hansen talked about, which was very important, is over here. However, so we know that there's some verrucous hyperplasia, which is exophytic, but there, in addition, can be a downgrowth of well-differentiated squamous epithelium exhibiting broad, blunt, reti ridges with intact basement membranes. There was invasion. So then there was invasion of the lamina propria. Um, and this now looks like verrucous carcinoma. So this is another architectural feature of dysplasia before it becomes verrucous carcinoma. And we're going to look at that in detail. So here are the new architectural features of dysplasia, which has been, which I believe is now in the WO classification, except for this criterion, which is not. So we're going to go through corrugated verrucous surface, hyperkeratosis, where the thickness of the, sorry, this is supposed to be keratin, is greater than half the thickness of the epithelium. There's atrophy, there's demarcation, which connotes clonality or abrupt keratosis with stiff segments, bulky endophytic squamous proliferation, and then the bulbous reti ridges and festooning we already all know about. Moving forward from 1985, we then go to this very important paper by Dr. Van der Waal, which was based on another paper by Dr. Shepman in 1995, 10 years after the PDL paper. And the importance of these papers are, these two papers is that they basically bring your attention to the fact that the size of a single or multiple leukoplakers together greater than four cm is very important regardless of whether there's evidence of dysplasia. So if you have L3 larger than four, and notice it can be a single site, and PO like this, or here yeah, L2 and PO, two to four centimeters, he stages this, and the staging of this correlates with the transformation to cancer. So notice that you can also have a stage three L3 greater than 4 cm PO. So this is getting a high into a higher stage of leukoplakia, more dangerous and still without evidence of cytologic dysplasia. But I bet if we looked at some of these cases, we're going to see these architectural features of dysplasia. Subsequently, we go to another paper by Dr. Gandolfo in 2009, who talks about PVL, how it is, starts as a flat shape in other words, is not verrucous, and then progresses to become diffuse exophytic, often multifocal, often, not 100%. And that the PBL changes start from a simple hyperkeratosis without dysplasia. And here I think they mean without cytologic dysplasia, and then et cetera, to a verrucous hyperplasia. This is the most important thing that I'm going to talk about quite a bit, which is the hyperkeratosis without dysplasia. We're all familiar with this very famous paper by Dr. Uh, uh, Serrero Lapiedra and, and Dr. Began and that whole group from Spain, 
where they divide a PBL into, or they stage the PBL or use diagnostic criteria divided into major and minor criteria, starting with having more than two different sites, that it must be Veruca's, does it really? Does it have to be two different sites? Or can it be, as Dr. Van der Waal said in his paper, can it be a single large site or greater than 4 cm? Uh, the, the lesions have spread, there is recurrence, and it starts from a simple epithelial hyperkeratosis. So again, we go to that to Veruca's hyperplasia. And the minor criteria is that when you add up all the areas, it's more than 3 cm, that is female, that they're non-smokers. And I don't think any of these are important, or the eight, the number of years that it's present is important. Uh, because I think we've all seen cases that move fast. We've seen cases that are on single sites. So from this, uh, this, this proposal of diagnostic criteria, Dr. Karad et al. in 2013 simplified it into four criteria, show, which is namely leukoplakia showing verrucas of what like areas, which I don't think need to be present, that they need more than two oral sites. I don't think that's necessary. Um, um, that when you added all the involved sites, it should be three centimeters, that there's a period of five-year evolution. I'm not sure I agree with that because very often the patients don't even remember when it started and the availability of at least one biopsy. So this is actually from this paper, the PBL paper. And this was called PBL. And I agree that this is proliferative leukoplakia, but I don't think this is particularly verrucous. Um, so, and, and it has these red areas. So my diagnosis for this would be proliferative erythroleukoplakia. And is it at multiple sites? They only had one photograph, but this looks like contiguous sites. In other words, it's one large lesion that has grown to involve the palatal mucosa, the rich mucosa, the vestibule, and onto the lip mucosa, labial mucosa. So what is important in the criteria for diagnosis of PL? Does it have to be multifocal or can, can one very large site with contiguous areas be enough? If there are palatal and lingual or, palatal, or buccal and facial involvement, in other words, palatal lingual, and then going between the teeth to involve the buccal and facial gingiva count as one contiguous site because they're going in between the interdental papilla or two non-contiguous sites. Must it be verrucous? And then the whole question of progression, how do we measure this if we're seeing the patient for the first time? Because obviously if we see a patient like this, this has obviously progressed. The patient didn't wake up overnight and have this appear overnight. So that's a difficult one to, a difficult uh, uh, criterion. And then recurrence is obviously retrospective. So we have to be able to make a diagnosis of PL without waiting for the recurrence. Yeah, um, so also because these lesions are so large, they're almost impossible to remove. So if you don't remove it completely, is that a recurrence or is that a progression of residual disease? So I'm gonna show you some other cases now of single site involvement. This measures greater than 4CM, is that a single site? Is this PL to you or a simple look of weekend? This is greater than 4CM at a single site. This is a proliferative erythroleukoplakia to me, or is it a simple erythroleukoplakia to you? This is a greater than three centimeter lesion, which is homogenous. Notice this is not verrucous, involving the buccal mucosa, the vestibule, and onto the, onto the attached gingiva as a single site. And this is a patient with this very extensive, greater than 4 cm leukoplakia on the gingiva, it's a little bit rough and not, it's pretty much smooth and homogenous for the most part, present for only two years. And I followed this patient for another two years and he developed a squamous cell. Does this, so he doesn't make the five-year mark. So I don't think the five-year mark is necessarily that important. 
These are two of my patients with polyptic leukoplakia, which I think you would agree, maybe a little bit rough over here, but these are not particularly verrucous. These are fairly homogeneous leukoplakias. This is another patient with a very smooth, very demarcated, again, connoting uh, mutation, uh, involving the dorsum of the tongue back to the base of the tongue and climbing up the soft palate and palatal mucosa. Notice this is not at all verrucous. So to me, it's better to just use the term polyptic leukoplakia. You can add the term verrucous. You can add the term nodular. You can add the term erythroplakia. It's all encompassing. Similar, uh, this is further to the paper by Dr. La Piedra showing that the malignant transformation from Lou Hansen's paper goes up from 87%, 100% in the Zakuska paper. Silverman, uh, here's another one at 57%, 60, 90, 40. This is the lowest from the Gandolfo group, and the average out to be about 75%, much higher than the 20 to 30% that we see in unifocal small local plaques less than three to four centimeters. Then in uh, 2018, Dr. Villa et al., sorry about this uh, little thing here, uh, published a series of 42 cases and noted that in our cohort, 28% were verrucous. And if you added the fissure, which some people may call verrucous, that will bring it up to about 46%, which is half the cases. But fissure is not the same as verrucous. Many of them are homogenous by one quarter, and one quarter were red and white. We use the single site greater than 4 cm as one of our diagnostic criteria, and contiguous sites greater than 3 cm as another diagnostic criteria. And the histopathologic evaluation was almost very importantly, initially always by architecture and organizational features, and then cytologic features, and very often the, they did not have the standard cytologic features of dysplasia. The, historically, the over-reliance on the standard cytologic features of dysplasia has led to the underdiagnosis of dysplasia, not only in PL, but in all leukoplakias. So this is from our paper showing this a very large, fairly homogeneous, smooth white lesion. Uh, so would you call this proliferative leukoplakia or would you call this simple unifocal leukoplakia? The malignant transformation occurred in 71% of cases, very similar to the 75% or so in that uh, um, sort of combined, that paper that combined all the studies and the follow-up for was for a median of only three years. However, in the patients with erythral leukoplakia, malignant transformation occurred in 100% of cases, which makes sense because we all know that it is that red area, the erythroplakia, that is very dangerous even in localized leukoplakias. And more recently, coming back now to the present, in 2022, um, one, this is one of my residents, and together with Dr. Kerr from New York and uh, our colleagues in Brazil, published 86 early initial biopsies from 59 patients. And what I want to show you is just this. Epithelial dysplasia was seen in roughly half the patients, but this is the so-called simple hyperkeratosis, that all the previous authors have talked about that I call HK not reactive. To me, that is the not reactive tells you this is not a reaction to a biting injury or toothbrush injury or anything of that nature. So be very careful. And the HK not reactive generally means they have the architectural evidence of dysplasia, but not the cytologic uh, evidence of dysplasia. Let's take a look. Oh, one other thing. A lymphocytic band, the so-called lichenoid mucositis, which I do not use in my sign out, except for inflammatory lesions, was seen in one third of cases. So this is from that paper. This is a patient only with these white lesions on the dorsum of tongue. Would you call this lichenoid? I do not call this lichenoid. This is not the delicate white striations like a spider web. These are broad bands and trabecular lesions. Look at the sharp demarcation, one of the important architectural features with very minimal, you could call this mild dysplasia. Here's another patient with a homogeneous relifted leukoplakia and developed a squamous cell carcinoma. And what is important here is a hyperkeratosis 
people to have the thickness of the epithelium, and this epithelium for palate is extremely atrophic. This should be about 15 to 20 cells thick, and it's only about eight. Here's a different patient with a very large lesion, contiguous sites on the buccal mucosa. Again, thickness of the keratin is same as the thickness of the epithelium, minimal cytologic atypia to none. We're relying on the architectural features of dysplasia. And this is, again, for buccal mucosa, extremely atrophic. So hyperkeratosis and atrophy is one of the most important architectural features. So we took Dr. Ha uh, Dr. Hansen's diagram and we redid it. Here's the normal mucosa. And, and when you biopsy, it can show an hyperkeratosis, not reactive, which can be atrophic or acanthotic. It can show epithelial dysplasia, or it can show a typical verrucous hyperplasia by architecture without evidence of dysplasia, but dysplastic by architecture. And this, this lesion can become verrucous or it can remain flat. When it transforms, all of these can transform to any of these, but they don't go from one to the other. So this is an atypical bulky squamous proliferation. There's no single cell penetration of the stroma. This is a conventional squamous cell, and this is a mucus carcinoma. Back to the present. So in 2021, led by Dr. Lester Thompson, who's a head and neck pathologist, with Dr. Wenick, Dr. Cohen, Dr. Pugina, uh, some very uh, a combination of oral pathologists and head and neck pathologists came up with these consensus guidelines for standardized reporting. Notice they also talk about corrugation, disproportionate hyperkeratosis, very thick, um, thickened orthokeratin with atrophy, skip segments, demarcation, and then the lichenoid inflammatory infiltrate, which I don't agree with that term, but you get my, my point and we're going to see examples of this. This came out at the same time, you can see it was in the same volume as a paper from my group showing that these are architectural alterations in epithelial dysplasia are the same whether you're dealing with a small, localized, typical conventional leukoplakia or with proliferative leukoplakia. Again, I repeat, this is what we were looking at. My first case I want to show you is this. This is palatal mucosa. Notice how thick the keratin is. The keratin is greater than the thickness of the epithelium. Automatically, this is architectural dysplasia. This is slightly bulbous reti ridges, a little bit of cytologic atypia. And for the palate, this is atrophic. So the diagnosis without any clinical is hyperkeratosis and epithelial atrophy not reactive, HK not reactive. Can you visualize this clinical lesion? This is what it looks like. So is this considered two sites, palate and buccal gingiva, or one contiguous site because it has gone in between the interdental papilla to be on both sides? This is a PL. Notice it is fissured. It's not particularly verruca, it's not warty, but it's fissured. And the fissures are what make it go up and down like this. This is the same patient showing that this he has other sites of involvement mandibular gingiva, and the pacomycosa, and look at the fissuring on this pacomycosa. Would you call this verrucous leukoplakia or homogeneous fissured leukoplakia? I just want to show an example of a different patient. This is a bark, and this is a leukoplakia. You know, I talk about bark a lot. This is reactive, retromolopat bark, reactive, hyperkeratosis, acanthosis, tapered reti ridges, joint at the tips. This is from here, and this up and down is this. Would you call this verrucous epithelial hyperplasia? No, because the epithelium is actually atrophic for the buccal mucosa, and what you're looking at, these grooves and troughs, is the fissuring, but it certainly has a, verru a corrugated verrucous architecture, but it's not a verrucous hyperplasia. So you see what I mean about the fissures. They can really kind of look very, very verrucous. This is clearly a verrucous, atypical verrucous hyperplasia. 
Notice there's very little atypia, very mild. And look at the lymphocytic band. I do not call this lycanoid. I call this a lymphocytic host response for LHR. And this is the patient. That was taken from here. And certainly these fissures have become very deep to the point that they look verrucous. This patient, you can see that she has a proliferative lesion. This part is quite smooth. She's developed a squamous cell carcinoma on the palatal mucosa from this very homogenous looking um, I think I showed you this patient before who had the verrucous carcinoma and also a carcinoma of the palate to show you that these biopsies showed another architectural feature of, excuse me, dysplasia, which is the sharp demarcation denoting clinality. Look at the slightly corrugated surface. So on this alone, you can call it dysplasia without any evidence of cytologic dysplasia. Look at another area showing you a skip segment. This is pathology, this is normal, this is pathology, this is normal. And this is a high part to show you. Yes, it's a little bit of dysplasia even here. And one of the ways, this is another case to show you the skip segments, hyperkeratosis atrophy, normal. Hyperkeratosis atrophy, normal. Look at the sharp demarcation. In this case, there clearly is a dysplasia present. This is just a high power. And this is the P63, P53, excuse me, showing the multi-layering of the nuclear, uh, nuclear positivity, which is classic for a dysplastic lesion. Not all dysplasias would show that. I just want to show you another case of two biopsies. Let's say you got this biopsy. How would you sign this on? So right away, we've got very thick keratin, parakeratin this time, greater than half the thickness of the epithelium. So one architectural feature of dysplasia, bulbous reti ridges, the second, as the second evidence of, uh, of, dis of architectural dysplasia, and a verrucous surface. Notice the lymphocytic host response. This one is from the mucosa, parakeratosis, very, very bulky squamous proliferation, lymphocytic host response. This is not parakeratosis like a not mucositis. And this is what the two patients look like. These are my patients. I did the biopsy on these patients. And look at this proliferative local breakdown, which is a proliferative. This is slightly verrucous, I agree. I've ulcerated and, and also red. Here's another lesion, and this is to particularly point out the lymphocytic band. This one is on the lateral. This one is from the lateral dorsal tongue. And this is from a different site. So I'm focusing on this lesion. Would you call this parakeratosis and lichen on mucositis? You very, very easily could. But what if you came with a photograph? So this case is a dysplasia, and I wouldn't have known it without the P53, continuous nuclear positivity, and the fact that this is an epithelial plaque. I'm sorry, this is a leukoplakia, sharply demarcated, which means it's clonal. And this is a case from Dr. Alexandra Villa. Sorry, I forgot to put his name on it. And this is lichen planus. So this is an inflammatory lichen on mucositis. This is a lymphocytic host response to dysplasia, which the lymphocytes recognize. This is what lichen planus looks like. This is not plaque type lichen planus. This is a leukoplakia. But if you believe in plaque type lichen planus, then you're going to say this plaque type lichen planus became dysplastic. And if you don't remove it, it may become cancer. I don't believe in plaque type lichen planus much, especially not when it's a case like this, absolutely without striations. So this is a patient with typical lichen planus. The patient had bilateral lesions. This is a biopsy, parakeratosis, all the features of lichen planus, lymphocytic band, destruction of the basal cells, blurring at the interface. This is a biopsy from the gingiva. Would you call this hyperkeratosis, lichen or mucositis? I would not. The thickness of the epithelium is greater than half the thickness. The thickness of the keratin is greater than half the thickness of the epithelium. And the epithelium is atrophic for the gingiva. 
doesn't matter. You may say this is a little atypical. It could be from the inflammation. This is atrophic, and this is a lymphocytic host response. I signed this out as hyperkeratosis and epithelial atrophy, not reactive, because I don't even talk about the inflammation because this is in response to a neoantigen in the epithelium, and this is the patient who then came to see me. Notice the sharp demarcation. Notice it involves the gingiva all the way down to the vestibule and up the buccal mucosa. This is a single site. There's no other lesions. I call this proliferative leukoplakia because it is greater than three centimeters and involves three contiguous sites. This is the patient. She also has it on the lingual gingiva. So again, are you considering this one site or two sites? that go across the interdental papilla. And two and a half years after I saw her, she developed the squamous cell carcinoma. And the diagnosis was delayed because of COVID and she didn't come in for her follow-up. If you ask her how long this lesion has been there, she will not be able to tell you. So this is a very important paper from Triple O or Quadro 2014 where Dr. Fitzpatrick and colleagues looked at histologic so-called lichenoid features in oral dysplasia squamous cell carcinoma, and she found that about 30% of all cases exhibited three or more lichenoid features. And the most important and the most common of this one-third is the band of lymphocytes. So I would urge you not to use that term, because when you say lichenoid mucositis, the clinician thinks that you mean this is lichen plant. So this 30% was also what Dr. Lau, my resident and I showed in those initial biopsies, the 86 cases of PL, about a third of them showed lichenoid or the lymphocytic host response or the lymphocytic band. So it's a very consistent feature that you see in one third of cases. So all of you look at this and you go, okay, why is she showing me an infiltrating, keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma? I'm trying to show you the lymphocytic band. No pathologist diagnoses a squamous cell carcinoma with lichenoid mucositis. It's silly. We don't do that because we know that these are tumor infiltrating lymphocytes or TILs. And the more you see, the better that prognosis. So let's take a look at the edge over here. High power will show you that where this is a normal epithelium, this is a dysplastic epithelium. And notice you get that lymph the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes or lymphocyte lymphocytic host response, which recognizes the dysplasia, which means that there are new antigens within the epithelium. So if you call this dysplasia with lichenoid mucositis, the clinician may think you mean, oh, this is arising from lichen planus. It's not arising from lichen planus. It's arising from a dysplasia with a lymphocytic host response. Let's talk about that lymphocytic host response. So this is a very famous uh, uh, you know, diagram. So we know that tumor cells, which includes dysplastic cells, exhibit PDL1, programmed death ligand. And this attaches to the PD1 uh, you know, this receptor on the T lymphocytes. So generally speaking, these neoantigens with dysplastic and tumor cells present, these neoantigens, are recognized by a T cell receptor, and the T cell receptor will then kill, these are the you know, T, cytotoxic T cells, will kill the dysplastic or tumor cells. When this checkpoint, this is called a checkpoint, is engaged, it stops the T cell from working. So when we use checkpoint inhibitors, which are anti-PD-1 inhibitors, like nivolumab and pembrolizumab, and anti-PD-1 inhibitors, it breaks the checkpoint inhibition, allows the T cell to engage with the new antigen and causes destruction and death of the tumor cells and the dysplastic cells. And we look at the pdl one scores and this we use this CPS or combined positive score, scoring the number of cells and the interaction to see whether or not we can use a checkpoint inhibitor to break this checkpoint for tumor killing. So I want to show you another case. This was a biopsy that came to me. Would you have called this hyperkeratosis and lichenoid mucositis? No, no, no. Right away, 
the thickness of the epithelial keratin is greater than the thickness of the epithelium. It has a corrugated surface. Two architectural features of dysplasia. Yes, there's destruction of the basal cells. Less. Yes, there's lymphocyte exercise, transmigration. Less. Yes, there's spongiosis. That even savat bodies. Look at the collar body. This is not like a knife. This is a lymphocytic host response to neoantigens. And look at the PD-1 staining, showing the interaction between the PD-L1 and PD-1 from the epithelium to the lymphocytes in the stroma. So this is a dysplasia. And this was taken. I did the biopsy. It's from this patient. So be very, very careful about calling these bands like an ornithocytis. This is a, a Dr. Hannum Hans uh, famous chart, which he comes up with one every 10 years and, and sort of upgrades it. And we know that tumor cells and dysplastic cells know how to avoid immune destruction by putting out PDL, the ligand. And we know that they also promote inflammation, but don't call it lichenoid, right? So the problem is that of this malignant transformation of lichen planus, in my opinion, is that many red and white lesions are just called lichenoid. And I call them erythroleucoplakias because we, and when these so-called lichenoid lesions transform, it's not lichen planus that's transforming, it's erythroleucoplakia. And then of course the pathologist, if the pathologist keeps calling these lichenoid mucositis, you may think that this is a plaque type lichen planus when it's actually a leucoplakia with early architectural dysplasia with a lymphocytic host response. So if those so-called plaque type lichen planus transform, it's not the lichen planus, it's really the leucoplakia that's transforming because we know it has a high rate of malignant transformation anyway. That's kind of how I look at it. So here's another um, uh, important paper that came out in 2022 that looks like the, we're going back to another hyperkeratosis, no dysplasia concept, um, which is that we looked at uh, several of these authors, and all of these are famous to you. And we looked at all these papers that had a biopsy and then a subsequent malignant transformation at the biopsy site. And I want you to look at just the bottom line. So there were 837 cases. And look at this, 466 over here of 55 to 60% of all the cancers arose from a dysplasia. We, we know that. We know dysplasias are very dangerous because they're already halfway there. But look at this, 234 of 837 or 28% of SCCs arose from what all of these authors call hyperkeratosis no dysplasia, which I call probably, I never saw these cases, but I probably would have called hyperkeratosis not reactive. So why is it that these hyperkeratosis, so-called no dysplasia, can become cancerous. So number one, we don't need cytologic evidence of dysplasia. You just need architectural features of dysplasia. And the earliest would be something like hyperkeratosis, very thick with atrophy. But what else can we look at? So we took in our practice, all of those so-called what we call KUS, keratosis of unknown significance. We don't use that term anymore because we know the significance. These are all dysplastic lesions by architecture. So ignore this heat map. I want you to look at this. So with these blue ones are the hyperkeratosis without dysplasia. So very similar to this group. And we compared them by sequencing with the dysplastic cases. And these were moderate to severe dysplasia. And we found that you can see here, there's no difference in the mutational frequency between moderate to severe dysplasia and hyperkeratosis not reactive. So in other words, keratosis, KUS or hyperkeratosis not reactive is hyperkeratosis or hyperkeratosis with no dysplasia is actually the earliest dysplasia by mutational analysis. And look at these frame shift, frame shift and missense mutations. We are going to come back to another study based on a different group of patients. So how does it work? If you have a normal cell, you get your first hit, you get a mutation, you get a clonal lesion that's sharply demarcated clinically and histologically, 
And I call this hyperkeratosis not reactive, and this is architectural dysplasia. After the second hit, you get more mutations, and now you have a phenotypic dysplasia that's not only architectural but cytologic, and you can see the dysplasia right here. Here's a normal, here's the dysplasia, very demarcated. And when you get your third hit on the dysplasia, you get your invasive cancer. It's a very nice model, and guess what? This is a model that Dr. Volgenstein, that you will know the name, uh, he's a famous cancer researcher, and he wrote a very short article in NEJM in 2015, calling it three, three strikes to cancer. And he just gave us a few examples, melanoma, pancreatic cervical, very similar to ours, colorectal. First hit is what he called breakthrough. That's what our HK, not reactive is. One cell and it just starts to proliferate and what it does is make keratin. The second phase is the expansion phase, second hit. Other mutations accumulate and we have the dysplasia and the invasive phase is your third hit. So this is the simple way to think of it, which is in keeping with all the other cancers in the rest of the body. Oral cancer is no different. So I thought that that meshes very well with the way I think about these lesions. So this is not a proliferative leukoplakia because it's not very large. This is only about 1.5 cm. So, but it is clearly one of those linear gingival leukoplakias, smooth and homogeneous here, a little bit rough and verrucous over here. The biopsy was a typical verrucous hyperplasia. It's not a reactive lesion. I've excised it. Two weeks after the biopsy, the lesion had recurred. So remember, recurrence is important in PL, but to me, it's important is because it's important because it's on the gingiva. It's very difficult to remove the lesion completely on the gingiva. And this is a patient one year later who was followed by an oral surgeon. And notice how far it's now spread over here, and it's spread to involve the lateral over here, and that we completely unblock excised this lesion, even though the only Dysplasia was architectural. Why do they recur when they're on the gingiva? This is from, again, Dr. Lemma's paper. When you have the gingival linear leukoplakia and you cut it out with a scalpel, it is more likely than not, you're going to leave behind a little bit of the surgeon. It's going to leave a, a little bit of the mutated cells behind. This is the first hit, and it will just proliferate and grow back over the gingiva. That's why gingival leukoplakia tend to recur. And that's why. We have started in our institution using a miquimod. I don't know whether Dr. Villa is going to talk about this a little bit, for managing proliferative leukoplakia of the gingiva. So do you accept that a single site, very large lesion is proliferative leukoplakia? Well, I do. This patient had mild dysplasia. Notice it goes all the way back. It's greater than 4 cm. Before treatment, during treatment, it turns chalky white. You can see becomes also very, very red, and already is broken up. This leukoplakia is already breaking up here, very white in the back, and then over time, it completely resolved. This is the eight-month follow-up. No surgery was ever done on this patient. A beautiful result with topical immunomodulation. So my question to you is, have I convinced you that a very large single lesion at a single site Qualifies for PL. Here's a very big lesion. Here's a very big lesion. There's not biting. There's not a bite keratosis because of the sharp demarcation, the fissuring, and the shape of this is wrong. Is the period, the triangle should have the apex pointing towards the back if it is a bite injury because it follows the opening of the mouth. So these are two different patients, but if you don't remove this, it will progress probably very slowly. You can see there's an another lesion here already, and it may become extremely large over time. So let's come back to our original slide when I started this lecture. Do you call these hyperkeratosis? I do not call any of these hyperkeratosis alone. This is my diagnosis. This is a chronic, this is the actual diagnosis that goes on the pathology report. Chronic frictional factitial keratosis, my clinician knows what that means, patients biting it. Bark, benign alveolar rich keratosis. Notice it has a corrugated surface, but it is retromolopad. 
It has a very classic and typical appearance. You've already seen this. This was a parallel biopsy. Hyperkeratosis is not reactive. Or hyperkeratosis with mild dysplasia. And this is what Dr. Hansen, Dr. Gandalfo, everyone else has been calling simple hyperkeratosis. I urge you to call it hyperkeratosis not reactive. This is hyperkeratosis not reactive because of the skip segment, sharp demarcation, thick keratin. This is on the gingiva, epithelial atrophy, lymphocytic host response to new antigens. Finally, I just want to finish with this new paper that just came out. I'm not sure. I don't think it's been cited yet, but you can get it. This is, this is a project that I did with Dr. Villa and Dr. Hannah, who is an immuno-oncologist at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. And this is the immunoprofiling of the high-risk proliferative. Notice we do not use the word verrucous because of all the cases that you've seen that were not verrucous. Uh, and localized leukoplakia, and I think Dr. Villa may be talking about this. And it's okay with repeat it because it's important. Notice that the diagnosis of proliferative leukoplakia was significant, uh, with significant decrease uh, cancer-free survival by hazard ratio of 11.25, and that the program's death lag in PDR1 was comparatively overexpressed among the PL samples with a higher score. Interesting predicting a worse prognosis. Following this, this is, sorry, this one, and actually this paper has already been, is out. This paper just came out last month, but this month, and this is a trial that we did using nivolumab for high-risk oral leukoplakia with me, again, Dr. Treister, uh, Dr. Villa, Dr. Hannah, and we looked at 33 patients who were put on nivolumab, and 20 of these had WES, whole exome sequencing. Six patients progressed to oral squamous cell carcinoma. And all of this, the ones who progressed, exhibited 9P21.3 somaticopy loss, number loss, compared to the ones who did not develop cancer. Here's the heat map. So here are the patients who did not develop cancer and the patients who did develop cancer. Notice clearly we have the different hits. This oral cancer is the third strike to cancer by Vogelstein. This is a mixture of probably first strike, first strike, second strike, second strike, first strike, a combination of, uh, of mutation of, uh, of strikes. So some of them are hyperkeratosis, not reactive. Some were mild, some were dysplasia. So this is a mixture, you can see, and this is a cancer. This is a beautiful example of it. And a lot of them actually showed, well, you can see for yourself and read the paper. It's actually very interesting. Uh, the CPS score was done and the scores range from zero to 80. And unfortunately, there was no significant difference between this, whether you had a low or high score uh, and they both, either responded or did not respond. So it really, the NEVO did not help them tremendously. So what's the future? I hope in the future there will be an international consensus that we really reach consensus on uniform reporting. I hope that we can simplify the terminology. I hope that it, today's lecture helped you to think about whether they truly are PDLs or just PLs. Because it can be, you can add PL verrucas, PL erythro, PL nodular, PL homogenous. Is fissure the same as verrucous? Does fissure fall into homogenous or verrucous? We should define this. Does it need to be unifocal? I mean, multifocal? Or can it be large and unifocal? What do we think about the buccal and lingual gingival lesions? Is that two sites or one site? And I hope that we will all use the new histopathologic criteria, which has been adopted by WHO, except for that hyperkeratosis atrophy, which I believe is very important, and that instead of calling them hyperkeratosis, not no dysplasia, you say hyperkeratosis dysplastic by architecture, or hyperkeratosis not reactive, or differentiated dysplasia, like in the vulva, and consider using the term lichenoid mucositis only if you really believe it's inflammatory. 
So this is a paper by from the Dutch group in 2020 that looked at differentiated dysplasia. So this is hyperkeratosis, no dysplasia, predicting oral leukoplakia malignant transformation, and it's right here. Considering only classic dysplasia, 11 out of 56 or 20% of patients progress. So that's what we expect. But with the incorporation of differentiated dysplasia or HK not reactive, a further 7% progress. So the combination was now close to 30%. So I hope that we've uh, achieved our learning objectives. I really thank you for your kind attention. And I'm happy to take questions um, during the Q&A. Thank you so much.